Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for being here this morning and getting up uh, bright and early to join us. Um, we're going to be talking to you today about some legal case studies involving generative AI um, so that hopefully um, you'll be on the track to identifying um, issues that might come up when your organization is using Gen AI and give you some practical um, options to uh, respond to those issues that might arise. Um, I am JJ Jones. I'm an assistant general counsel at Microsoft working in cybersecurity. Jim Skukis, also assistant general counsel at Microsoft in cybersecurity and AI security. My name is Catherine Forrest, and I am a, uh, currently in private practice at uh, a firm called Paul Weiss uh, in New York City, where I do AI and generative AI all the time. But I'm a former federal judge and had issues of algorithmic bias that came before me. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dundee West, uh, Assistant General Counsel of Cybersecurity uh, at SK, and really good to be here. Um, been anxious to talk. Uh, so to get us started, we're going to um, ask you a few questions. One, to make sure you're really awake, make sure you're in the right session today, and also just to give us, uh, your panelists, a sense of um, your prior exposure to Gen AI. So first, um, can we get you all to raise your hand if you know what a meta prompt is? Okay. What about raising your hand if you know what a threat model is? Okay, all right, all right. So you, you all are in the right room. <laughs> that, is, that is positive. Um, what about jailbreaking? Who knows what jailbreaking? Okay, okay. So, so we've got, uh, we've got a, a good, good audience on our hands. Now, has anyone used Gen AI to identify or assess cyber risk in your organization? Okay. So we understand the concepts and, and we're at the precipice, uh, perhaps, of starting to apply them for cybersecurity purposes. Got it. All right, well, let's, let's get started. Let's jump right into the case studies. All right. Um, and just, just before that, quick framework, these are entirely fictitious studies. Um, they are really just um, here to help tee up some of the kinds of legal and ethical issues an organization might encounter. Um, and, and so the facts are written in, in such a way as to really make those issues uh, come through and present themselves. Um, all of the views expressed by the panel are our own views, not that of our employer. Right. So in case study one, oops. case study one, we have company A, which is a cloud service provider developing a new digital assistant. So uh, this is a, your, your friend in your email inbox, and it allows the user to use natural language to um, instruct the assistant to take actions based on the content of your inbox. So it can do simple things like summarizing emails, but it can also take actions on, on your behalf. And there's a, a robust plugin ecosystem that allows integration with third party services as configured by the user. So, this is your, you know, uh, your app store, or your skills, uh, the, the things that individual users or enterprises can, can make available uh, for, for greater flexibility in the assistant. So, some potential actions it can pay bills on, on your behalf based on, on uh, content in your inbox. It can make orders to online vendors, and of course, aut autonomously schedule meetings with uh, you know, on the user's calendar. So, next slide. So, how do we start thinking about something like this? Well, the uh, the, the traditional first step for security is a good place to start. What what are the ways that this could go wrong? This is the the building the threat model component of your um, of of the process, and. The difference is just that uh, generative AI is going to raise a different set of threats from what we might be accustomed to in, uh, in traditional security, but it does start in the same place. Uh, I discussed this a little bit with one of my own clients in, um, in AI security before coming here, and the way that we were framing it is you, one way to think about these new threats is if social engineering would work on a human assistant then you, can, you should at least consider the possibility that it would work on your AI. And we've, we've seen this sometimes with some of the more creative types of um, jailbreaks. 
Uh, some of them involve uh, you know, uh, appealing to the, uh, you know, making an emotional appeal to the AI. So mm -hmm. it's important as you, as you start, think about what are, what are the threats here that uh, I haven't considered before. And honestly, in the case of this particular one, I'll, I'll note uh, if it has the ability to, to, uh, to pay invoices, then it's just as susceptible as a human would be to uh, business email compromise types of attacks, fake invoice attacks. And similarly, it could be susceptible to um, fake vendors and fake orders. These are, these are fundamentals that you would worry about having the controls for uh, and you might address with training for a, for a human assistant. Uh, what are the equivalents for your generative AI? That's where things like the Metaprompt come in, and we, this is uh, not going to be a focus to, to give you the technical tools, but rather the, the, the way to think about it. Um, but as, as you think about it, I also you move on to the next two questions, and I think of them uh, as questions you should be asking simultaneously, and I, would, and I certainly do. Uh, what are the user's expect expectations around privacy of the, uh, of, of the content in the AI? What are their ex expectations about security? It turns out in an AI world, uh, you need a different kind of data and you need, uh, we are still figuring out what are the expectations in both. I think that in many cases, uh, especially uh, a case like this where they're working with the, the content of your inbox, people are very protective of their interactions with the AI. The email, everybody's protective of, of the content and confidentiality of their email. And that just goes even stronger when you're talking about, uh, in addition to the email itself, what are, what are the words that you're putting into the AI? Put it together, people feel very protective. On the flip side, what are people ex expecting of security? If you're a provider of an AI service like this, uh, people are going to expect that, your users are going to expect that you are being thoughtful and cautious and that you will prevent and have systems in place to block uh, the kinds of compromises that I was just talking about, the, uh, the invoice attack and so on. But it turns out that in, uh, in the AI world, there are, uh, there's a tension between those two. And so we ask these questions first, uh, so we have a tension and also none of these things are fully formed. And if, if this is your first uh, attempt at shipping a, a generative AI service, um, you need to start exploring uh, you know, beyond your own individual expectations, but what, what, will, what will others see? Uh, so we've got privacy, we've got security, and then we've got the question of uh, how, do, how are we going to apply those as, uh, uh, as, as the, the service is running. Uh, what's interesting about securing generative AI is that the, the threats that are going to be uh, coming in through the AI are encompassed in the words that are placed in, into, the, into the AI. It is the content of the email, it is the words that you typed into, the, uh, uh, into, into instruct the AI. That's also where the threat is gonna be. That's the, uh, uh, the jailbreaking. There's an interesting kind of attack called a cross-prompt injection attack, which basically uses not the, um, uh, not the prompt, not the words that you yourself typed in, but the content that the AI is going to rely on separately. In this case, what if someone were able to create an instruction to the, to the assistant that came in through the email that they sent you, and they, uh, you know, they, they find a way to hide that? That's a, that's a well-known, now well-known kind of, kind of attack. Are you going to be in a position to, to detect those attacks? Are you going to be in a position to investigate if a breach occurs? Because we know that sometimes you get lucky and you detect in the moment. More often, you're going to detect the attack later on and need to figure out what went wrong and what, how can I adjust my product to, um, to improve that. And so uh, do I have the right data for that detection? And to go along with that, do I have the rights or permission to actually analyze that data in that way? This is personal data, and when, when privacy law comes into play, we have to be thinking about, uh, is, is this an authorized use of the data? Um, in many cases, if, if I am an enterprise selling to, uh, selling to, or excuse me, if I am a company selling to enterprise customers, 
I have to worry about the GDPR uh, controller and processor framework. And as a processor, uh, I need to be making sure that I'm only processing the data under the clear instructions of the, the customer. Well, do I have those clear instructions? Uh, do they want me analyzing the content of email coming into their employees? So that's the sort of thing that we have to uh, ask ourselves as we go into this. Um, and then finally, we're talking about a plugin ecosystem. What is my responsibility to, uh, for the actions of the plugins? We have certain expectations when it comes to uh, app stores and things like that, that Apple or Google will be scanning for, uh, for malicious apps and weeding them out. Do I have that same accountability for uh, uh, when it comes to my plugins, which are going to have in, you know, potentially access to the entire inbox? So a place where we need to be cautious and thoughtful. Uh, next slide. So what can we do? Well, start with understanding our risks. Build our complete threat model of the service, including our AI-specific risks. This is where we have to, to do a lot of extra research because this is a, a, a um, uh, not fully understood area. Uh, new attacks are coming along uh, day by day, and we have to be thinking about uh, if I am not expert enough in it today, and possibly none of us are, what are the sources of data that I need to go to or sources of expertise that I need to go to to figure out who, who can tell me about these threats. What do I need to know? So build your threat model. Work with experts to understand the, the threats that you haven't thought of yet. Think about your creativity, ways to, ways to break it. If you have the option, consider what, what a, uh, an AI red team might be able to assist you here, whether, whether building one your own, which is hard, or look for, look for experts who can, who can contract and provide at least a bit of support. Um, the, the next stage is, the, is what I think of as the, the, the self-knowledge and the uh, knowledge of your users component of it. Before you can start making decisions about use of data and what's appropriate, what are customer expectations, well, your customers may not actually have the, the complete expectations either. So uh, as a starting stage, I, I recommend figure out your own values. You know, what, uh, what are your core values on appropriate use of your service and your obligations to protect users? Are you going to protect only against security threats? Are you looking to protect against abuse of your, uh, of your service in some form or another? That'll, that'll tell you a lot of what kinds of permissions you need to, uh, you need to have. If you're worried about your, um, uh, your assistance somehow being used to generate malicious content, well, that's a very different uh, step than if you're just worried about uh, abuse to create new security threat. So start with getting clear with yourself, what are your goals and what are you trying to accomplish? And then do the same thing with your users. That's where you start to communicate. Maybe you have some, uh, some beta customers or early stage preview customers that you can start to understand their expectations. And and make sure that as you're working through those expectations that you're considering the full scope of, of the, um, the challenge when it comes to working with their data, not just security, but privacy, exploring, exploring all of those. What kinds of uses are they comfortable with? Uh, finally, having, having understood your values and started to uh, articulate them, write them down, that's, uh, you can really help yourself by uh, you know, giving yourself breadth there. Uh, start publicly documenting your approach. Transparency documentation will always be a help. Customers will always appreciate more, uh, more sharing. And as long as you're giving them the tools to clearly understand what you plan to do, what is the benefit? Because if you've looked, you're, you've probably done a better threat model than your customers have, but you owe it to your customers to make sure that they understand what, what was the underlying drivers. So document the controls, document uh, you know, your approach to data for both privacy and security, and document which kinds of controls you're providing and wh what are the trade-offs that you considered. And then finally, I'd like to say, you should consider what customer controls you can provide, but understand that every additional control you provide potentially creates a new risk as well in the sense that, you know, if, uh, you know, to take a traditional security example, uh, MFA, we all agree, is, is be it's better turned on because it is more protective. If you have it on by default, 
but you're giving the ability to turn it off, well, that is, a, that is a path for your customers to increase their security risk, but you're giving them a choice because that, that's valuable for the customer. Uh, there may be other security choices where you should take away that choice because anything else would be irresponsible for, for you to ship, and you need to consider both of those possibilities as, uh, as you consider. Uh, I, particularly with, with the plug-in ecosystem, you, uh, there's a whole additional set of controls. What kind of controls should you give to um, opt-in and access that, that a plug-in might have to, to the individual data? And that's, uh, in many cases, power that you want to give to the user to, to make the best choice. And, and all ask of you, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just going to say, all of that documentation or explaining you know, to your customers the trade-offs between privacy and security and why you took that approach, write it in plain English. Write it in, yes. in, in yeah. language that customers who pick it up can actually comprehend. Completely agree. Yeah. And I was just going to ask about the plugins um, and to what extent um, are third-party plugins, do they play a role or any particular role in this kind of issue? huge. Uh, as, as the provider, you want to maximize the capabilities and the addressable market of your, of your product, but every new plugin that you allow into your space is massive risk. Uh, it's massive risk on day one for you know, how much do you trust the provider. Uh, each one of those providers is going to have extensive permission into the same data that, the, that your original uh, service has access to. And even if you find that the plugin, you analyze it and on day one, it looks good, looks good. On day five, it still looks good. You never know what'll happen on day 10 or day 20. And you know, you're, you're putting yourself in the position of constantly paying attention uh, to it. I think our customers most, most of the time are going to expect high level of accountability for the plugins that you allow into your space. We've seen it with app stores already. And I think there's, there's just no escaping that accountability. And that's fair because you're often as the service provider in the best position to interrogate that. Can I do one more? Go for it. How about uh, updates to plugins? Because you've got a plugin, you've got a third party plugin, you've evaluated the third party plugin and it meets your criterion and then there's an auto update and it's yeah. a push. What do you do with that? It's exactly the same, pro it's, it's, it's a continuing of, the sa of that same risk. It's in or it's, uh, it triggers both privacy and, and security concerns. Uh, I would add in AI is non-deterministic, so we also don't know of the, uh, you know, what are the tricks that we might not be catching. And it's certainly not going to be cost effective to AI red team your entire plugin ecosystem. So at some point, you're going to also have to consider your risk tolerance for, for these kinds of things. If, if I may jump in, I, I just wanted to re reiterate what Jim was saying about, you know, imagining like what can go wrong and having a threat model. Um, with AI, like there's been a lot being done, you know, like looking on screen, like how the tool work, you know, testing prompt injections, you know, reducing hallucinations. Uh, but when you talk about a threat model, I would encourage everyone to think about uh, AI being an ecosystem and, you know, third party risk becomes increasingly important, understanding like all of the different downstream suppliers um, and things like that. So when you're thinking about what could go wrong, like approach it from a, almost like a traditional red teaming perspective, but look at it like what could go wrong throughout the whole life cycle of how that tool makes it to the user and all the different downstream and third party suppliers. Well, I want to get us to our, our second case study. <laughs> all <right. laughs> okay, all right, it's so interesting, Jim's. Uh, all right, we're gonna um, take, uh, take it down uh, a moment, uh, down to a, uh, a what was a first generation AI set of tools that now with generative AI have become more complex. They raise some of the same issues that existed before, but they're more complex. So let's talk about them. And I want you in your mind as you think about this particular scenario to think about multimodal large language model training, all right? And that's the utilization of multiple modes of training, including, for instance, photographs, digital files, audio files, a variety of files to train the large language models that are actually under, uh, under the sort of the substrate of these tools. So let's go through our fact scenario first. We're gonna follow then a similar format 
We'll talk about what the fact scenario is, the questions posed by that fact scenario, and then some of the potential responses. And there are multiple responses, but we'll give you a few of them. So the first issue here is you've got a large retailer, all right? A large retailer who is losing, or which is losing, millions of dollars annually in theft. A retailer losing millions of dollars annually in theft. Now I want you to pause on that because this is for perhaps one of your customers. When you're thinking of the appropriate tool, the very first portion of this fact scenario is something that you can actually stop on. Large retailer. What kind of large retailer? That can actually change the way in which you evaluate this tool and the particular issues raised by this tool. Now, the tool that this large retailer has decided to actually license in, very unlikely that the large retailer is engineering from the ground up, so they've got a license to this tool, is a tool that's using facial recognition to determine potential theft, gait recognition, which is behave, you know, walking around, uh, for instance, how you actually walk or how one walks, and behavioral recognition, how you might be glancing at material in the store, how you might be pausing in a particular area of the store. So now in this fact scenario, we've talked about pausing on the large retailer and asking yourself, is this customer of mine potentially, this large retailer, what kind of large retailer is it and does that impact my thoughts about this tool? When you're thinking about facial recognition, you want to think about where is that coming from? This is going to get into the questions posed. Gate recognition. You want to think about where is that data coming from? Behavioral recognition. Not only where does that data come from, but how may it overlap with gate recognition? Now, with a multimodal tool, unlike the world of narrow AI, where you might have deployed facial recognition where there are cameras and they're actually sort of whizzing and whirring over a large data set and identifying potential shoplifters, you've now got a tool that's layering all three of these, one on top of each other, and you've then got multiple issues to be considering. So you've got that. Then you've got the tools flagging likely shoplifters, all right? So this tool, which has got facial recognition built in, gait or walking recognition built in, behavioral recognition built in, it's actually then flagging shoplifters, potential shoplifters, and following them. So what you want to think about then is that already at that point, you've got an issue with whether or not you've got false positives or false negatives, right, already, because you're going to have a confirmation bias immediately built in. Now, assume that you know, the vendor knows, and the customer knows that the validation for that tool is an accuracy rate of 73%. Pretty good, actually, for this kind of tool. It's a pretty good validation rate. But you also know that there are more false positives for people of color. And even with that, using this tool is saving through the 73% uh, accuracy rate, it's saving millions of dollars in loss avoidance a year. But you also know that there's been a bias complaint, anonymous, to the company's hotline, and you can assume it's either from an employee or you can assume that it might even be from an outside third party. So what are the legal and ethical questions that get posed by this kind of tool? Well, first of all, one thing that we saw from the first slide is that you've got potential ethical issues that are really actually going as a cascade throughout this entire fact scenario. 
So while these tools may seem like they're easy tools, that they're tools that are tried and true and we've been using cameras and retailers for a long time, with a layered tool from generative AI picking up through multimodal training, picking up a variety of different characteristics, you now may have a large language model that has actually got ethical tools of what's right and what's wrong, but what's fair and what's unfair in ways that you may or may not be able to disaggregate very easily. So you've got some legal issues as well. The ethical issues of fairness, unfairness, right or wrong, are you, have you uh, actually tagged the right people to follow or not? One set of issues. But the legal issues are also present. Right now, we have all over the country in different states a variety of laws that are being passed at the state level that indicate that the utilization of these kinds of tools uh, can actually carry risk if they are identifying false positives, particularly on protected categories. So you then are going to ask, well, is there bias in the training data? Now, this is going to be different in a generative AI tool than it was in a narrow AI tool. In a narrow AI tool, you might have only been looking at facial recognition training data, or gait recognition training data, or behavioral recognition training data. But now, with a multimodal generative AI tool, that's going to be potentially all mixed in. And the tool is going to be assessing patterns based upon the aggregation of some of those characteristics. So you'll need to be thinking about the potential bias in sophisticated ways. So for instance, you might have a question as to whether or not between gate, by, gate uh, data sets and behavioral data sets, there's a cultural component, a demographic component that you may or may not be aware of. In other words, the way someone can walk, the tool may be assessing as a behavioral issue as well as a gait issue, but it may in fact be a culturally specific issue or at least have identifying characteristics. So you may be building in bias in ways that are different from the narrow AI tool. Now the 73% uh, validation rate, okay, well how do you actually assess that ethically and legally against the fact that you know it's got some number of false positives? Well, one thing you might think about is, is it better than humans? Are humans who are sitting there and been watching these tools, were they coming to that issue with their own embedded implicit or explicit biases where they had gate assumptions about how people walked and whether that indicated some kind of bias? Do they have behavioral assumptions? Do they have facial recognition biases built in? So is the 73% when you ask yourself about the false positives of the 20, 27%, you have to think, well, how do I actually ethically weigh those things one against the other? One thing you can ask yourself is, uh, is human review of the positives. When the tool comes up with follow this candidate, follow that candidate, we're going to now follow, the tool's going to grab them and follow them around the retailer, does human review and oversight at a relatively early stage mitigate the risk? Maybe it does. Maybe it does if the right training has actually been applied, right? If you've got humans who are not trained necessarily in the way in which gait recognition, behavioral recognition, and facial recognition can have layered issues on top of each other, then maybe that training would be insufficient to mitigate. But maybe it would be sufficient to mitigate if the training was appropriate. So these are the kinds of questions that you want to ask. 
but accuracy versus fairness I want you to have as one of your thought patterns and think about the 27% because you've got 27% of people who are being inaccurately flagged. Let's go to the next one. Go back to the uh, to the potential responses. Yeah. We're already on the potential yes. responses. There we go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, for the potential responses, you have, as we've already said, a known ethical issue. It's known. It is not an ethical issue that you have to wonder about. It's an ethical issue about right and wrong that you understand. And you will want to then analyze whether or not you have done appropriate uh, red teaming of the tool itself. Have you actually inquired as to the data sets used? Now let's go back to that moment before when we were talking about who is the large retailer. Because maybe the type of retailer matters as the customer for the type of tool that you're going to deploy for the type of data set that you're going to feel comfortable using. Maybe the population of customers matters. Maybe every single piece of that matters to the ethics of whether or not you've got an accuracy versus a fairness issue. So you could consider then alternative data sets. You could consider moving away from one of the kinds of data sets that's often used with these tools which are arresty data sets, right? Arresty data sets. Why? Because arresty data sets are not conviction data sets. They reflect the biases, potentially, potentially, of the arrestor, right? Not necessarily anything about whether there, in fact, has been a criminal act occurring. So you need to consider the origin of the data set. The legal issue that you're going to want to think about is whether or not you've got biometric laws in place in the particular state, whether you have algorithmic bias laws in the particular state. Why? Because you know you have already gotten a complaint to the hotline. And now, 73%, you think about, well, what's my response to the 73%? I'm actually out there marketing this tool to potential customers, and I know I've got a validation rate that is much more likely than not to be accurate. But is it fair to have 27% of real human beings actually having a moment of being approached and their life interrupted with a false accusa accusation, an inaccurate accusation of a crime, of shoplifting. So accuracy versus fairness. And you have to actually assess that against a variety of, a variety of things, including the corporate culture, including the legal standards of the potential for actually engaging and assisting in what could become a false arrest. And so you want to make sure that you have really kicked that tool. Now, how about the human review and, inter and, and uh, potential intervention? That could be a critical mitigating factor for your utilization of that tool. Because if you actually show that you have put in place or recommended to a customer that they put in place an appropriate training uh, set of uh, 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 sessions for utilization of that tool, you may then be attempting to assist them with mitigating the risks of the false positive and driving it down. Because a human might come with their implicit biases and explicit biases, humans do, but if they've been trained to try to ask themselves about them, they might be able to say, well, this, what, what, this person just walked in 
and has been wandering around. They have none of the normal behavioral characteristics of staring at merchandise, looking to see who happens to be in their vicinity. But they happen to have the tool picked up on them probably because of the gate. Or maybe the tool has picked up on today, looking at who the tool has identified people of color more frequently than not. And I, unless I as the human, can identify an additional indicia of potential fraud, am not going to allow the tool to flag that person entirely. There are different things that can be trained into it. So that's where we are with this tool. These are the potential questions to ask yourself. And then you can also, as a result of that question, ask yourself whether or not the tool is ready for prime time. I think that's a super interesting scenario, and I think we could ask you a million questions <laughs> and discuss that for another hour, just like just that one case study. But right. I want to make sure we get to Dondi's scenario and also have time for questions. Yeah, and I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, I took a little bit of a different approach. You'll notice that this scenario sort of focuses on the actual threat actor and why, they're, why are they doing you know, what they're doing. So. Here we have an example of a AI tool that's driving innovation in the cyber defense space. So we have two companies. We have 313E, who's a threat intelligence firm looking to create a competitive advantage. So they contract with this vendor known as BMF. And the vendor uh, has this AI tool that scans a lot of databases, repositories, you know, open source threat intelligence, and as well as like proprietary uh, data sources in order to identify new exploits uh, with a with a hint, you know, with, with a focus on zero day exploits. Um, so, so unbeknownst to BMF, I mean, unbeknownst to 313E, BMF, you know, they outsource a lot of their data collection and data cleansing and preparation to out. Uh, overseas firms. Um, so we have a nation state actor who, you know, and, and this is what I want everyone to focus on. You could have a situation where AI, you know, can be can, can, in the cyber defense space can become so innovative and so impactful that you could have threat actors who, who arise who don't want that tool or that technology to be successful. So here, you have a nation state actor who goes and targets all of BMF, BMF's um, suppliers and they manipulate the data they collect and you know, they, their primary goal is to uh, degrade the integrity of the, gener the ultimate generative AI model. So the, the, the manipulated data ends up poisoning uh, and, and impacting 313E's intelligence analysis and you know both companies suffer brand and reputation um, losses and it ends up being catastrophic um, so you have a situation where you had this promising tool that that was innovative in the cyber defense space but a nation threat actor did not want that to get you know market penetration um, next slide so there's a lot to unpack here um, in the ai space there's a chance or there's a likelihood that cyber attacks will become more sophisticated and more calculated. So it's going to become increasingly import, important when you have a cyber attack to consider the uh, motive of the threat actor. All right, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that more. And then also the question arises, you know, when it comes to 313E, like what should they have been doing in terms of third party risk assessment? Another thing is that I threw in the issue about BMF using overseas suppliers. You know, why might that be a problem? You know, when you think about things like different laws and regulations in different regions, uh, different geopolitical risks in different regions. And then, you know, going back to that third party risk, um, uh, you know, concern, what, when you do a contract with an with a, uh, AI vendor, you know, what type of things do you want to be in your service level, level agreement? And then finally, like, how should 313E's customers, as well as 313E, like, how should they be thinking about and unpacking, like, what just happened? Like, it was a cyber attack on a promising AI technology. Next slide. So when I talk about motive, you know, traditionally, 
you know, when we think about well, what was it, what was their motive? Like we usually put it into like mainly like two, uh, three categories. Like it could be, you know, uh, an outright offensive cyber operation or a cyber attack. You could have, you know, cyber espionage, um, or you could have like a combination of them. But then like motive in the AI space will likely become more nuanced than just, oh, it was cyber espionage or a cyber attack. So, you know, you have threat actors who like to combine both technical effects. So in our world, like, we like to think about cyber versus cyber. Like, hey, you know, get the, you know, contain the threat actor, get the threat actor out of our environment. You know, that's technical versus technical. But with AI and when you start having um, threat actors who have a mo motive of affecting the overall market and adoption of AI, you have to also think about are they applying a technical effect along with a psychological effect. So psychological effect being like something that's done to affect your decision making. So here, the threat actor clearly wanted to decrease the adoption of this tool, all right? Um, you know, number two, like AI vendors. Um, so yeah, AI vendors are different, but that's not a reason in and of itself to change how you do third-party risk management. It's all about like your company, how it approaches, you know, what's your risk tolerance? But you want to recognize that, you know, as Catherine just discussed in detail, as well as Jim, AI brings with it, you know, unique types of risks. So you just want to make sure those are covered. Number three, um, AI risks should really look at like geographic location of downstream suppliers, particularly those suppliers that are located in more risky countries, more authoritarian countries. Um, so you always want to look at, you know, geographic location of like downstream suppliers. Next slide, please. And then, you know, when you think about your service level agreements for AI vendors, you want to focus on those things that Jim and Catherine called out. Um, things about, you know, whether or not it's being, um, whether or not we're being transparent and things like that. And then lastly, how should we be thinking about it? Like, should you just, you know, stop innovating in AI just because you experience an attack? Probably not. Um, you still want to innovate, but you want to um, consider like, you know, the risks your, your company's risk tolerance versus like potential return on investment of adopting tools. So I know that was a lot to unpack, but I wanted to just go through that and give an example of what it looks like from a threat actor standpoint and how, should you shoot, how we should be thinking about how threat actors will operate in the AI space, specifically when we have an AI tool that's being used for cyber defense. So I know that was a lot, but I wanted, wanted to make sure we had time for questions and answers. Well, thank you, John D. That, that was fast. Um, if, if folks have questions, can you come on up to the microphones? I'm uh, mindful of making sure we have time for questions. Okay. Um, so then in the interim, maybe we'll just talk through our, uh, our apply it slide, what you should start doing um, right away when you get home. Just really, you know, think through and try to identify the generative AI uses or even prospective use cases at your organization. Um, so you can start to think through some of these issues as well as you know any um, current vendors that you're using that are leveraging gen ai which speaks to the third party risk that's come up in each of these uh, case studies as well as any third party apps that are already leveraging gen ai used by your organization um, three months out we'd like for you to start to really think about your threat surface area which is um, ever expanding and evolving with gen ai uses um, and also understanding the data sources of that gen ai for example you know in catherine's case study she talked about um, using a rusty data as an input um, we have a question yes jump I right do. in please in talking about uh bias in algorithms. Uh, you, I believe, referenced the New York City law that requires any AI that's being used in employment decisions to have a, uh, an audit, a bias audit of the algorithm. Um, my understanding of the law, and <clears throat> it, it could be wrong, but um, all it requires is that there be an audit. It doesn't say what the audit must reveal. Put differently, uh, if the audit determines that the algorithm uh, is 17% biased and a different company 
has an audit, and their algorithm is 47% biased. Both of them are in compliance with the law, which just requires that there be an audit. There are no standards um, that exist, as far as I know, um, for how biased a system can be. Um, you know, to the person who is adversely affected by that biased algorithm, it, it's 100% biased as to them. <laughs> Um, so, how, how do you go about dealing with that where, you yeah, know, okay, it, there, there are no standards? Well, it, there are uh, legal standards in the case law relating to when you would have a disparate impact case. And so, while your audit will tell you the quantitative measure of whether or not you've actually got a tool that is spitting out a false positive at a particular rate, so you get that quantitative measure. The issue is whether or not, as a matter of law against the case law, that you would have in any number of employment decisions, for instance, or in the retailer situation, any number of false uh, you know, detentions uh, or false arrests, because you can even have that within the four corners of a, of a retail store, whether you've got a disparate impact. And that takes a different kind of quantitative analysis. So it's not that the statute has to define it, it's that you compare the statute of algorithmic uh, validation against the case law of disparate impact. 47% would get you into it, you, you'd have an issue there. <laughs> and, and Catherine, would you say that um, uh, it kind of, it also goes, you know, doing, doing the audit kind of goes to your actual knowledge of, of the bias? Well, uh, absolutely, I mean, if you know that you've actually got a particularly high level of actual bias, uh, then your marketing material ought to be clear uh, about that and or if you're the retailer itself, uh, you want to make sure you've taken whatever measures you can to mitigate. Because it's not that you can't use the tool, it's that you want to mitigate as well as possible against the tool. Well, and I would also be really interested to understand from a benchmarking perspective, right? You know, what are similar tools that are doing similar kinds of things? What's their accuracy rate, right? What's their fairness rate? What's their bias rate? Because yeah. if yours is a bit out of out of line with that, then that just further goes to your own you know, organization's knowledge that we could have been doing a better job, we could have been driving more fairness, um, and there were existing mitigations that we were failing to leverage. I, I think especially in, in new areas of technology like AI, right, you have your existing case law in areas like employment law, but in a, it's all reasonableness at the end of the day. I would, I would add also, I feel like all, all three of our studies invoked ethical issues, which obviously are not legal. But because of JJ's point just a moment ago that, that you know, this is a nascent kind of developing area, I think that ethics are going to inform reasonableness and, and you know, the overall perspective of, of you know, people looking at your decision making are going to say, you know, was there an ethical framework? How did it fit within that ethical framework? I don't know, what did you all think of that? Yeah, I, I would just say one, one little practical pointer, look at the indemnifications and where they begin and end in any mm -hmm. of the licensing agreements. Because that's what, when you're, if you're the licensor of the tool, you want to understand your uh, responsibility for a false positive. And there's, of course, just the business risk, right? Like, you know, yeah. set the legal risk aside too, right? The reputational risk, the business risk, the, the public perception risk, the consumer perception risk, right? You, don't, you know, you don't want, just because you, you picked the wrong tool, now your organization is the face of the next boycott, right? Because that whistleblower sent that report, it got, you know, sent to some government agency, they're now investigating your company for how you're using something when you knew this bias rate was, was you know, quite high. Um, so, of course, right, you know, it's, it's the, the totality of these different risks that um, these tools can present, not just the legal risk, it's the, it's the business risk just as much. And I think we have uh, one minute left. Any other questions? Any super quick questions? I had a super quick Last question minute? for okay. uh, yeah. for Dondi, which is you mentioned alignment, getting aligned uh, with um, at the end of your 
piece. How do you get aligned? I mean, what are the techniques for getting aligned with some of those risks? Um, I think alignment with the business uh, is incredibly important. Um, you want to make sure that the, you know, at the end of the day, like a business is a business. So you want to make sure that like your risk, I don't think JJ was just mentioning that, like you have to have an appreciation for the business risk and ensure that you're not like putting something in place that's going to be, you know, a blocker. So yeah. I think about business risk when I think about alignment. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.